Hello, hello, welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains indescribable. And today, we are going to get into the subject of aircraft again in the top five about not just planes, but aircraft in general that are just, frankly, bizarre. These are five aircraft that are just insanely weird. The Aerospace Line's Pregnant Guppy. Yes, they really called it that, although admittedly in this case I totally see why. This aircraft first took to the skies on September 19th, 1962, and it was designed for ferrying oversized cargo items which is why the fuselage is so bulgy at the top. One of its most notable uses was transporting parts for NASA to be used in their Apollo program, which of course put men on the moon. Up until that point, NASA had been using barges to transport their large rocket components, but this was extremely slow and expensive. The Guppy was actually put together using salvage pieces from other aircraft, and the majority of it was based off of a Boeing 377 Stratocruiser. Aerospace Lines International was specifically founded to build this plane, and when it first took off, there was some concern. The airport actually notified police and fire departments to be on alert because they were afraid that this aircraft just wouldn't fly. It looks so weird and so large and tall. It just doesn't look aerodynamic of face value, but believe it or not, the Guppy performed admirably. It was an exceptional aircraft. It did experience more drag and that limited its top speed, but outside of that, it was totally fine. The Guppy wound up saving the Apollo program time and money by moving the S-4, which is a Saturn I rocket stage, much faster than the three weeks it would have taken by barge, and for a cost of about $16, or $140 in today's money, per mile, which is not that bad at all. The Guppy went on to be used for other purposes as well, but sadly by 1979, it was scrapped, though it did pave the way for other models in the Guppy line. Aerospace Line's Mini Guppy and Aerospace Line's Super Guppy were also both constructed, and the Super Guppy is actually still in operation in some places. Other aircraft that took inspiration from the Guppy include the Airbus Beluga and the Boeing Dreamlifter. The Guppy showed that you can expand the fuselage of an aircraft up even if it looks wrong, it actually doesn't affect the flight of the aircraft as long as it's done well. It proved the concept and did it flawlessly, so as weird as they are, this is an example of a successful weird aircraft. The Baum and Voss BV-141 Okay, what is going on with that? That just, I don't, what the, it's, that's, that's wrong. Everything about that is wrong. Built intentionally as an aircraft with structural asymmetry, as in both sides of the craft don't look the same, it first flew on the 25th of February 1938, and it was to be used by the Luftwaffe as part of Germany's efforts in World War II. As odd as these look, it was designed this way for a couple reasons. For one thing, it was designed to be a tactical reconnaissance aircraft, and the idea was to give the pilot as much visibility as possible so he could see what was out there. It was also thought it could be a light bomber as well, and in some ways the asymmetry actually worked well for it, at least in one way, as the torque from the engine was actually cancelled out as a result of the balancing act between both the pilot's compartment and the engine-mounted fuselage. The tail was originally symmetrical, this was changed for balance reasons, and the only issue it ever really had was induced yaw. Yaw is a rotational movement that basically changes where an aircraft is pointing on the x-axis, if that makes any sense. But this is normally controlled by the rudder. Because the rudder was off to the side, things got a little wonky when it came to controlling it. But through testing, it was proven that this wasn't an issue at low speed, and at higher speeds, it could easily be kept under control through trimming surfaces. Though 28 were built for tests, it was never actually put into full-scale production. There were two reasons for this. For one thing, the preferred engine for this craft was actually the BMW 801, and this was shared by the Fokker Wolf 190 fighter aircraft. Germany felt the Fokker Wolf 190 took the priority over reconnaissance aircraft, 
Additionally, there was another craft put forward for the reconnaissance role, the Focke Wolf FW-189, that not only used different engines in the 190, but also did the job of the 141 just fine. There was just no reason to put the asymmetrical plane into production when they already had a plane that did its job just as well. Examples of it did actually survive until the end of World War II, however, but most of them had been damaged by bombing runs before the Allied forces got to them. At least one was actually captured by British forces and sent to England for examination, though no examples of this aircraft survive today. The Flying Pancake Aircraft Now, when I say that, most of the airplane scholars watching this are probably going to immediately think of the Vought V-173. And I'm going to get to that, because that is the one that was quite literally called the Flying Pancake, for reasons I think are abundantly clear. However, I do want to call attention to another example of this overall design that kind of started over in Germany in 1938. Although the projects actually have nothing to do with each other, and I haven't found any evidence that either side was aware that the others were doing something similar. But in July of 1938, a farmer by the name of Arthur Sack entered what he called his AS-1 circular winged model into what was known as the Reichweid Contest for Motorized Flying Vehicles. It was held at Leipzig. What was unique about Sack's design was that it was a circular wing aircraft. It was bizarre, but had interesting potential in some ways. Ernst Udet, who was a German pilot during World War I and a Luftwaffe Colonel General, was intrigued by Sack's design and encouraged him to continue working on it, despite the fact that Sack, again, was a farmer. He was not an aeronautical engineer. This small model aircraft was simply a hobby for him at the time. But encouraged by Odette, Sack went on to make four additional models of the AS-1, eventually culminating in the AS-6B1, which was effectively a full-size example of the initial circular wing model. The prototype craft actually was built off of the landing gear cockpit and pilot seat from a Messerschmitt BF-109, and was powered by an Argus AS-10 C-3 engine. It was made of plywood, but for testing purposes, that was totally fine. However, when testing actually began in 1944, the control surfaces didn't work as well as they should have, there was severe instability due to the frame not being able to compensate for the torque of the engine, and the thing actually couldn't even achieve flight. It was only known to make a few short hops. Sack continued working on it, but he refused to allow other developers of aircraft work on his design. It was suggested he contact Messerschmitt for their input, but he absolutely was fixated on the notion of doing it himself. But it never worked. Eventually, it would be damaged in a strafing run by Allied attacks, and the aircraft was probably scrapped soon after that. By the time United States troops had arrived in Brandis, where the prototype had been in April of 1945, there were no traces of the AS-6. Though, it is sometimes wondered if testing of this craft may have led to conspiracy theories regarding Nazi UFOs. Because it has that look about it. And in terms of UFO sightings, I think we can also say that perhaps the Vought V-173 Flying Pancake may be part of that too. This aircraft was, again, not related to Sachs AS-6. Vought started working on this concept in the 30s. Sort of an experimental precursor to the flying wing concept. The 173's flying surfaces would be effectively the whole aircraft. The entire aircraft would be the wing. The prototype was meant to only be a proof of concept, and only use two 80 horsepower Continental A80 engines that were meant to be used for F4U Corsair propellers. To avoid torque issues, the propellers were meant to rotate in opposite directions, and the small wing design resulted in an aircraft that was very maneuverable and had excellent structural strength. The prototype, which first flew on 23rd of November 1942, never could go very fast, but it was, in fact, just a proof of concept. Its testing arena was actually set up in Connecticut, and it resulted in reports of UFOs from locals, even though this aircraft is obviously not a UFO. The aircraft was notorious for being able to be flown extremely slowly. The test pilots, which actually included Charles Lindbergh, believe it or not, found that it was exceedingly difficult to put the aircraft into an aerodynamic stall at all. It was so good at staying in the air. However, the handling of the craft did suffer due to the shape of the lifting body. So while it would stay in the air, it was hard to maneuver when it was going slow. The aircraft apparently acted as an air brake when it was pulled into a high angle of attack. 
so the control surfaces didn't operate well at low speeds. Still, the concept did seem interesting, and the Navy wanted to continue development. This resulted in the Vought XF-5U, which was not known as the Flying Pancake, as some sources mistakenly call it. They called this one the Flying Flapjack, which is basically the same thing, but still there was a difference. Two of the Flapjacks were actually produced and first flew in 1943, but calling it a flight is questionable. The specifications of the design promised amazing maneuverability, just like the Pancake did, with speeds up to 452 miles an hour, or 727 kilometers an hour. But by the time they got this far in developing an aircraft like this, the United States Navy, which had approved it, was switching from propeller craft to jet aircraft. The whole point of the Flapjack, initially, was to have a craft that could take off very quickly. It was an early attempt at a short takeoff and landing craft, now, the Flapjacks could do this very well, but at the time it looked like jets would be the future of airplanes, and these were prop planes. As weird and unique as they were, and maybe interesting, it just didn't seem financially reasonable for the Navy to continue developing something that was probably going to be obsolete within another decade. And the whole thing was cancelled by the 17th of March, 1947, with one of the test craft only ever being allowed to do a short hop on the runway, that were not actually true flights, although it's likely they could have done this. The prototype of the concept, V-173, was transferred to the Smithsonian Museum for display, and is currently on loan to the Frontiers of Flight Museum in Dallas, Texas, where it's on display at the moment. The XFUs, however, were both scrapped. The only one that was actually completed proved to be so structurally solid that they had to destroy it with a wrecking ball. I mean, Good lord, what did you make it out of, Vought? It's an aircraft, not a tank. But hey, good for it, I guess. Put up a fight, Flying Flapjack, I'm proud of you. Don't go quietly into the night. Show them your potential, your worth. We could have had a whole legion of Flying Flapjacks in the sky. And I don't know about you, but that sounds cool to me. As weird as they are, that's cool. The Kalinin K-7. I don't know if this was clear to anybody, but this aircraft is very... Very, very Russian. The K-7 was designed by World War I aviator and Soviet aircraft designer Konstantin Kalinin, and it was a big chungus. Big Ivan of a plane. Considered for use as both a heavy bomber and a civilian transport, it had capacity for 120 passengers and 7,000 kilograms or 15,000 pounds of mail. If it was used for a troop transport, they could have fit 112 fully equipped paratroopers inside it, and as a bomber, they felt it could have been armed with eight 20mm autocannons, eight 7.62mm machine guns, and up to 9,600 kilograms or 21,200 pounds of bombs. The aircraft's design was strange, as while it technically had a fuselage, much of the cargo space was actually in the wing itself. It had a big, thick wing, with the engines all integrated inside of it. It was originally meant to use six engines on the leading edge of the wings, but because the project exceeded loading weight, they added two more to the trailing edges of the wing. And believe it or not, the thing totally flew! Only one was ever built, but it first flew on the 11th of August, 1933. And in fact, it completed seven test flights before it finally crashed. The reason it crashed was due to something that was revealed in the first test flight. The aircraft was dealing with serious stability issues due to a vibration that in retrospect is believed to have been caused by the airframe resonating at the engine's frequency. Their thought at the time was just to shorten and strengthen the tail booms, because in that era there was little known about natural frequencies of structures and their response to vibrations. Kalinin and his designers would have had no way of knowing that this was the actual reason for the K-7's instability, and had they been aware of it, they probably would have been able to fix it, and they might have actually seen use during World War II. Sadly, that was not to be. Due to the vibrations, there was a structural failure of one of the tail booms on the 21st of November, 1933. This crash actually killed a total of 15 people, 14 on board and one on the ground. It was speculated at the time that the crash actually may have been related to sabotage, though there was really no evidence of this. It probably was that vibration issue that was never resolved because they just didn't know what was causing it. Another one never got built, and poor Kalenin wound up a victim of the Great Purge, or Great Terror, of 1937. 
when many rumored spies and opponents to Stalin's rule were arrested and unceremoniously executed. Some sources say Kalinin was executed because of the K-7, but it's not believed this was the case at all. It simply was someone fingering him as an opponent of Stalin. And the Great Purge is actually a very complex issue that is often completely ruined by articles simply saying Stalin killed everybody, which is not exactly what had happened. It was mostly Stalin's underlings that were severely loyal to him, and Stalin himself, at least at first, didn't think that the Purge was nearly as large as it was, and it only realized the scale of what was going on when the deaths had reached about, well, 700,000 people. I'm not saying he has no blame in it, because he does, obviously. He did little to stop it once it had happened, but it wasn't all him. The Avro Canada VZ-9 Avrocar. That is clearly a flying saucer. That is literally what that is! Why are the Canadians building flying saucers? Did you talk to British Rail about this? Actually, British Rail probably talked to them because this thing first flew on the 12th of November, 1959. It was a secret US military project that Avro Canada was working with our armed forces on, and the idea was to create a VTOL aircraft that took advantage of the Kalenda effect. The Kalenda effect describes the tendency of a fluid jet to stay attached to a convex surface. The result is an effect that means that something like a balloon, or perhaps a flying saucer, does have a remote tendency to stay in the air a lot more than one would think. There's a lot more that goes into the physics of that, but that's kind of what the Avrocar was working with. It wasn't just a jet engine mounted in the middle of a saucer, and it was just using downward thrust to levitate. That wasn't really it. It was a lot more complicated than that, and in fact, again, many articles have not mentioned the calendar effect as being a part of this, even though that was literally the whole point of it. They're just like, haha, <laughs> flying saucer, jet go down, what a dumb idea. No, 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 no. This was actually well thought out. And the US Army was funding it because they felt that they could use it as like a high performance helicopter or levitating jeep. And the Air Force wanted them because a highly maneuverable flying craft like that could give them a one-up over those filthy communists. It was the Cold War, after all. But problems started pretty early on. Thrust issues were never resolved, and at higher altitudes, the saucers were not at all stable. It was very difficult to control them. It was only when they were near the ground that they could be kept at a remote, stable position. But even testing in that regard caused other issues. Because of the calendar effect, the air from the jet engine was kept around the craft. This air was hot because it was from a jet engine and the heat was so oppressive on the saucer that it actually baked brown the instruments that were utilized inside the craft. There's no telling what other damage it could have done had testing continued. But after a while, it was decided that more conventional aircraft were probably the way to go, and not this weird space-age flying saucer nonsense. The crafts were viewed as a dead end in VTOL design. As cool as they are, they're simply not something that could be developed into anything workable. Despite being created by Avro Canada, the project had used US military funding. Therefore, legally, the Avro cars were the property of the United States military. The crafts were actually used for some flight tests and wind tunnel tests by the military, and they both actually wound up as museum pieces in preservation eventually. Yes, really. One of them is undergoing restoration at the U.S. Army Transportation Museum in Fort Eustis, Virginia. The other one is on display at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. So I guess as odd as they are, and as unsuccessful as they were, it's nice to see what likely led to a lot of weird calls for UFO sightings in the 60s actually get a pretty nice retirement in the end. Before we go, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward. Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Sumdu 267, Brightline Blue, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsun 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, and Lock Kraken. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.